Uh, fabric, rethinking the way network applications are designed. Okay, he will uh, uh, he will describe the fabric programming network and its high performance in network computational and storage capabilities, as well as uh, the national cyber infrastructure. It uh, interconnects, making it possible to. Uh, envision and deploy completely uh, uh, new services and uh, applications in a real world environment, okay? So uh, before we welcome uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Griffin for his talk, please remember that uh, to sign, sign in at the end of the talk, all right? Thank you very much. So let's welcome Dr. Jim Griffin. All right, thank you. Um, so, uh, yes, so I'm actually going to talk a little bit about Fabric today, and actually perhaps even less about Fabric and maybe more about how you actually might use Fabric. And um, by the way, I should also mention that I'm sort of representing the Fabric team, and there's actually several faculty involved in this, as well as staff members. Uh, Dr. Fay is co PI, Dr. Calvert is a co PI on the Fab project that you may see, see mentioned along the way. Uh, we have several other staff members uh, as well that are involved in that, and so um, I'm actually representing a lot of their work. Um, but, so let me uh, just start out by taking a look at the internet. And the way the internet works today is that you have the internet, and then you connect your devices to the internet, uh, whether those be mobile phones, whether they be computers, desktop, laptops. And um, then, as programmers, as uh, computer scientists, we often write programs that are going to run on, those, on, the, on these systems. And oftentimes we use what's called a client server model. You've maybe written applications that way. And these applications are designed and run at the edge of the network. Uh, they run on the systems that are located all around the, uh, around the edge of the internet. And um, the internet itself basically uh, is just a store and forward mechanism that actually has routers inside the internet and their job is to get your packets from where they enter the internet to the destination on the other side of the internet. So that's its goal in life. That's what routers have been doing for years. They do it extremely well. This, has, this model has worked very well over the years, but the uh, reality is, is that it, it actually has some problems. So if you think about the internet, um, it's basically just forwarding that packets. It sort of magically happens. There's protocols and routing systems inside of the internet that decide where your packets need to go. They, they pick out the path. You have relatively little control over where your packets are going through the internet. Um, and all this, the coding that you're doing always runs at the edge. And even if you say, I'm running in the cloud, the cloud is technically at the edge as well uh, of the internet. Um, they may be located, in some cases, sort of in data, in, in data centers that may be located near uh, internal ports of the network, but uh, effectively, uh, you're running code at the edge of the network. Um, there's all sorts of other security-related problems related to authentication, um, knowing where the data originated, uh, provenance of data. So the question is, what if we could also not only program the edge of the network, but we could actually program the network itself? And this is one of the things I'd like to encourage you to think a little bit about today is if you could program the network, if you could write programs that not only ran their code at some edge node in the network or in the cloud, but also ran inside the network itself as packets were transmitting from one side to the other, what, could, what would that change? And so if I could actually write a piece of code or an agent that ran on network routers and it would actually be able to see traffic as it's moving through, or in fact, direct it, route it. The question then is, what would I do with that? And how would, I, how would that actually change? So we've actually asked this question to a lot of people. And the, question, and the answer we often get back is, well, I've never thought about that. That's not the way the internet works. Um, so we've never had that opportunity. So we have a bit of a chicken and egg problem here because they've never given it any thought. Um, at the same time, there's no need to make it uh, uh, be able to program the internet if nobody has applications for it. 
So one of the things that we'd like to do today is to actually get you to think a little bit about what some of those applications might be. All right, so some possible ideas. You might think about putting an agent in the network uh, to cache data in the network. So if it's moving through the network and uh, we actually can keep a copy of it as it's moving from the server, let's say, back to the client, if another client then were to come along and ask for that same data, we might be able to say, oh, I have a copy here. It's inside the network and I will simply return it to you because I have a cache copy inside the network. So you could write programs that are specific to your particular application that know how to do caching, decide which information is the most important to save, and you could perhaps write agents that run inside the network that help with your application. So you now have multiple pieces of code, client, server, and the in-network part. Um, another option, you could potentially actually expand that idea and say, boy, I'd really like to put a whole sort of data lake inside the network. I'd like to be able to have clients from anywhere be able to access essentially sort of a distributed file system sitting inside the network. I could have code running on network routers that's caching data, and any client could either read or write data into that system. And so uh, you could think of it almost like a, a distributed file system that's running inside the network. And how would I change my applications if I now have this wide-scale distributed file system that the network's helping me with? All right, so yet another idea. Maybe I would like to process data near the end service. So I'm contacting a server over there. They're going to return data back to me, but I don't really need all of that data. I only need portions of it. I'd like to sort of look through it, filter it, um, maybe transform it in some way before I send it back. So wouldn't it be nice if I could take my agent and push it just to the edge, right up to the server where it needs to be pulling data from, and uh, then be able to process that data. All right, so the data now comes back, but my, my agent intercepts it, and it actually analyzes it in some way, and it only returns the information that I'm interested in. In some cases, it may just say, actually, you know, I, I don't actually need that data coming back. I, I issued a a request and uh, that, that particular information isn't of uh, value to me. One area where you might consider this, um, and in fact we've had some people looking at this problem, so imagine that you have a whole bunch of public uh, cameras, video cameras out there that anybody can go to. You can connect up with an API call or there's a web page out there that you can go to and you can see what's going on on those public cameras. Well, it might be nice to collect data from those. And in fact, you'd like to be able to analyze the data. Maybe you'd like to do something like do training of AI models based on the video that's being collected uh, at these public cameras. You don't actually have access to run your code at the camera. Um, those systems are, are, are owned by the people that are hosting those cameras. But instead, what you could do is you could actually push an agent out near the camera that would, in fact, interact with the camera on your behalf. And oftentimes, the feeds that are coming off of these public cameras are, have relatively uninteresting information. Uh, if they're pointed at a parking lot or something like that, it may be great for counting cars during the day, but at night, it's kind of boring and uninteresting, and you really don't want to be sending the data back. So you can interact with those things right now from a client by talking to them, but you'd be uh, pulling in so much data that it would create an implosion as it actually the data comes back toward the client. So you could imagine that these systems are actually sending data to your agent, and your agent only returns the information that's actually of value to you. So you could imagine writing a sort of a distributed application now where the servers and the clients and the code inside the network all make up the application. And so the question is, what, what would I do with these things? And it's one of the things that I'd really sort of like uh, you to give some thought to as to what you might actually do if you had such a system. All right, so this notion of everywhere programmable uh, really sort of changes the way we think about writing applications. We've never had that ability before, and the question is what could I do with it? Well, one of the areas that you might think about using it is in IoT applications. So, I gave you a couple there. I'm just listing a few more here as well. But IoT applications, oftentimes, so think about all the IoT devices out there, the doorbells that you have out there, the, heat, the, the uh, HVAC um, modules you have on your wall, they're all sending information back. They typically send that information back to the cloud. Um, and so there's basically a model where you have devices at the edge, 
sending to a data server, data center somewhere where the cloud is then processing that information. Um, that model works relatively well as long as you've got very good network paths, great connectivity. Um, there are examples where we've been working with some folks who have been looking at using these things to monitor storms and hurricanes. Well, these Internet of Things devices sending data back work really well except when a hurricane or a storm comes through and knocks out the Internet. The question then is, could I have taken some of the cloud computing capabilities and pushed it out toward the edge or pushed it out toward where the services are and put it into the network so that whatever is still available and running can form a, a, a cloud of sorts and be able to, say, and, and be able to uh, share, share information. All right, um, another area that uh, people are looking at applications is if you need to provide very low level latency. So it may be that you are doing some uh, um, mobile applications or autonomous, autonomous vehicles where sending things into the cloud, waiting for that to process it and send you back the, the response is just too long of a loop. You need to be able to send something quickly to the edge of the network for them to do some computation on it, on some reasonable resources, and then send that back to the, for example, vehicles if they're driving down the road and need to make decisions very quickly. Federated learning. Uh, this is a system where you actually have learning or training going on at several different locations, and then you build up the model by actually collecting data from all of them. So in this case, you may want to actually push federated learning into the network. Um, we're also seeing an awful lot of uh, logging that's been going on, whether that's uh, tracking of messages, mail messages, for example. Right now, oftentimes, you want to see where did this mail message come, come from? And in fact, what relays did it go through on the way? Or what packets, uh, what, what routers did packets go through on the way? Um, so the, um, I'm going to go through all of these, but you can see that there's a whole large list of ways that you can think of applications that might make use of a, sort of an everywhere programmable network. So one of the things I'd first like to do is encourage you to sort of think about what research you're doing or what uh, programs you're writing and how might they make use of this type of network. So that then, of course, raises the question, well, do we have such a network, and, and how, do we, how would you uh, build such a network? All right, so Fabric is such an everywhere programmable network, um, and we actually are starting to build some applications and services on top of that, uh, that do just that. All right, so here's the Fabric network. Uh, this uh, Fabric uh, network now actually spans the United States, and I'll show you in just a minute, it's actually going international. But uh, the, some of the key things to note here is that we have routers uh, located all across the United States. Uh, they are linked together by a terabit per second core. So the yellow line represents a terabit per second core. This provides very high speed transmission across the continent of the United States. So you can not only program the network, each of these nodes in the, in the system here is programmable, but you can also transfer data at very high speeds. The little blue lines are only 100 gigabits per second. Um, so that's still quite fast for, uh, for many applications. So there's significant uh, bandwidth availability, but also there's significant computational capabilities. All right, so um, who, are, who is it connecting? And I should perhaps go back just quickly. Um, you'll note that the spots in orange here are often listed as supercomputing sites that are part of the NSF access system. So many of the national supercomputing facilities are actually interconnected by Fabric as well as several of the cloud test beds. So you see Cloud Lab on there, Chameleon, these are cloud test beds. And in addition, there are some of the network, wireless network test beds that are connected on. And what's not shown so clearly here are some commercial cloud providers as well on both the east and the west coast. All right, so not only is Fabric this test bed where you can try it out, but it actually interconnects real systems, and it allows you to do, actually run real applications across that. So um, this just shows a couple of the, the systems there that we, in fact, interconnect with Fabric. All right, Fabric was recently extended through a, another program called Fabric Across Borders, or FAB, and so it now interconnects to sites both uh, in Europe and uh, uh, in the, uh, going that direction, and then also to uh, Japan and Hawaii and sites uh, off <coughs> uh, over here. 
And you can see that the, um, there's actually some major research sites like uh, CERN is located over there uh, where they have some of the high energy physics work going on. And uh, we also then can reach uh, some of the sites where data is being collected also in uh, South America through a connection down there in uh, FIU. So it's expanding not only uh, nationally but internationally as well. All right, so who's uh, involved in Fabric? Well, first of all, this is a project funded by the National Science Foundation as part of a mid-scale funding opportunity. Uh, it started in 2019, and it went first through a construction phase to actually implement all the routers that you saw around the, the nation, the links that connect them, and also then connecting into each of the facilities that are near the endpoints of the system. Um, the key players here are UNC Renzi, uh, University of Kentucky. Several of the folks that are, are, are working on the Fabric Project are here today. Uh, Clemson University, the University of Illinois. And the backbone itself is being provided by ESNet. So many of the high-speed connections are being provided by the Department of Energy's ESNet. And I should say there's a large number of other uh, facilities at the endpoints that are working with Fabric and connecting in as well. So uh, over 20, 20 organizations that are part of that. Okay, so basically, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that there is a need for an everywhere programmable network. Um, and it's not only that you need to be able to program these routers, but they need to be sufficiently capable. That is, routers in the past have been sort of lightweight in the sense that their goal was to just forward packets. Um, if we actually want to do things like run machine learning on them or training, uh, we're going to have to have to have significant computation inside the network. So this nationwide programmable network uh, offers compute and storage inside the network. In particular, we have things like GPU cards, we have FPGA cards, we have programmable NIC cards that can actually process packets directly on them. There are actually some programmable switches inside the, the fabric infrastructure. And these also have the ability to provide quality of service. So you can actually go and say, I'd like to have a particular amount of bandwidth or a, a connection with a particular um, latency. Um, that, the quality of service is something that's kind of still in, still in development. Um, we have some early implementations of that. And then, as I mentioned before, it interconnects a lot of the uh, high performance computing centers around the nation. All right, so what does a a rack look like. Um, our current racks, and unfortunately I have to, I uh, can't see it on my screen there, so um, are typically look much more like a supercomputer than a network router. So it's actually a rack of computers, and it has a control node that actually operates the overall set of, of, of systems there. They run an OpenStack uh, um, virtualization system on them, so you can actually create virtual machines on these. Each of these uh, machines has a multi-core um, uh, multi CPU. They have large amounts of memory on them. Each of them has, uh, will have at least some number of network cards. And then they may also have GPU cards. And in a few, in a few cases, they have FPGA cards as well. Um, we typically are using Mellanox, uh, ConnectX5, and ConnectX6, which are actually programmable themselves. You can actually uh, do some programming, but they're also virtualizable, which is nice in the sense that each user that wants to use it can get their own sort of virtual network card out of the system. The key uh, feature here is that uh, what we're using in OpenStack is what's called a kernel bypass capability. And this allows you to create a virtual machine after you've created the virtual machine, you can map the GPU directly into your machine, or you can map the network card directly into your machine. So you actually have direct access to hardware. So even though you're running in a virtual machine, you actually are directly accessing the underlying hardware. So you can run often at line speeds uh, with these different devices. All right, so this is a significant change from typical network routers in the sense that we actually have a lot of compute. So if you want to run these jobs, you want to do AI, you want to do caching data, we have large amounts of storage on each of these systems as well, often in the uh, hundreds of terabytes range. 
you can store data there, you can process it, you can retrieve it quickly, you can program network cards to be able to uh, process the data without actually even necessarily hitting a GPU or CPU. All right, so here's sort of a, a graphical representation uh, of these cards. Each of them has what's, each of the uh, fabric racks has a, a management switch and the management switch is used for control functions to tell us how we, if you want to deploy your code in there, we do that through the OpenStack and the control framework for Fabric. Uh, that comes in through the management switch. Then these little yellow uh, blocks here represent what we call worker nodes. These are the compute nodes that make up the rack, and we then de deploy your code onto one of those nodes inside of a vir virtual machine. Then we, at that point, map in an FPGA card or a GPU card, depending on what you need. And all of those cards are connected to what we call the data plane switch. The data plane switches between all the racks are connected via the ESNet backbone. In some cases, uh, that will be 100 gigabits per second. In other cases, it will go up to the uh, terabit per second uh, range uh, by uh, um, combining links together. In a few cases, we actually have uh, P4 switches as well. If you're familiar with P4, uh, that allows you to actually program the, the switch as well, and you can link that into your experiment. So the interesting thing about this is that you can now create experiments that uh, you actually write the code and decide what's going to run inside of these network routers. Okay, so what can you do with this? Well, this will allow you to write programs that run in the edge, they run, in, they connect right up to the cloud. Uh, we have commercial cloud peering capabilities. We have compute and storage and network processing inside the network. And also, since everything is virtualized, you can get your own set of virtual VMs inside the network and create your own sort of sandboxed experiment where your traffic is only seen by you. Um, this actually also allows you to take your, your system down, try it, reboot it, rerun the software and bring it back up. So you can do very rapid text fix cycles. And um, we have geographic distribution, not only across the United States, but internationally. And we actually have been starting to build significant sets of software on top of that that will allow you to make use of uh, the system very quickly. So today I'm not actually gonna demonstrate too much about how to use Fabric. We have several tutorials about that, but I really wanted to get you more to think a little bit about what uh, you might be able to do with Fabric. All right, so let me come back to some example use cases that people are actually doing and building with Fabric. All right, so one of them that uh, has become recently very popular and of uh, great interest is that many institutions have scientific devices that they would like to share with other researchers at other institutions. Uh, these are often very expensive devices that uh, only a single institution might have, but you can think of them like being electron scanning microscopes, they might be uh, genome sequencers, they might be any, any sort of device that you'd like to control or be able to send in samples. Now obviously there's a, usually a human aspect where you have to put some sample onto the, the device, but once that's in the device, then oftentimes you can um, control it remotely. So there's an ex uh, experiment going on. This is being done with folks at Rutgers and the uh, uh, ERN group. And one of the things that they've been doing is trying to make access to a cryo-EM machines available. And they're using Fabric to do this. The code that they were typically do running in the past, they would have to run on a little supercomputing system right next to the cryo-EM machine. Uh, that they were using. And then they would have to create pathways for researchers to be able to get in to access this, uh, this piece of code that would then act as sort of a bridge jumping into the cryo-EM machine. So what they're doing in this particular case is that they're actually taking that code and pushing it to the edge, to the fabric node that is sitting right next to the institution that has the cryo-EM machine. And what they then do is they create what's called a facility port off of the fabric node, and, and they actually can have a direct connection into the cryo machine from the fabric rack. They then program and put all their code on the fabric rack. Now the interesting thing about this is that you might say, well, they've just taken some code that they were running inside their institution and pulled it out into fabric. But this now allows 
any institution, even if they don't have a supercomputing, uh, supercomputer sitting next to their device, to be able to run something on the fabric rack. Um, this allows for very uh, fast uh, interaction and control uh, over their, their particular system. All right, so um, they've actually done a, a more complicated experiment where they not only had the system where they're connecting in and they're running data and, and they're running the code, uh, which they pull in via Docker containers onto the fabric rack, to run a cryo-EM machine and give remote control. But they now actually also taking that data, once they've pulled the data out of the cryo-EM machine and now it's been pulled into the fabric rack, the fabric rack then distributes it across fabric through other containers to supercomputing sites. In this particular case, they were using the uh, MGH PCC supercomputers and the Chameleon Cloud Lab computers to do processing of the data. So in this case, they combined several things together to do both remote control and remote access as well as being able to then take the data that's coming off the feeds there, send it into Fabric and efficiently transmit it and break it apart and send it to the appropriate services that then needed to compute on it. So here's an example where uh, they've pushed uh, several pieces of code into, into Fabric. Another uh, project that actually is being worked on here by folks here at Kentucky uh, and is to work with the high energy physics group out of uh, University of Illinois, uh, Chicago, and then uh, also University of Michigan. They have been gathering data at the CERN Super Collider. They gather huge amounts of data there. And one of the things that's been a problem for them is that in order for their clusters to work on that data, all the nodes need access to it. It's huge amounts of data that they'd have to pull back across the Atlantic. So what they've done as a first step uh, to solve this problem is actually to take their code, which they've actually implemented, which would typically run here in, in the States, called ServiceX. ServiceX would go grab the data once from CERN, pull it across the Atlantic, cache it there, and then allow all the supercomputing centers in the United States to access that data from the ServiceX server. Um, what they've done is actually push that code. Now, instead of being here, they pushed it right up toward the CERN resource out there. And they are collecting the data locally, massive amounts of data. They filter it, decide which data needs to be uh, sent off to clients, and then they send off only that data there. What we've been doing here as part of the project at the University of Kentucky is to actually say, well, we can actually make use of a new protocol called Named Data Networking, NDN. And NDN, unlike the TCP IP connections, NDN allows you to actually cache copies of the data as it's moving through network routers. So as we start pulling the data back across the fabric infrastructure, the data is actually being cached inside of all the routers that it goes through so that any other client that then asks for it can quickly pull it directly out of the, data, out of the network without having to go all the way back uh, to the ServiceX service. So here's a, a situation where we're combining edge processing with in-network processing to be able to make very quick, quick and efficient uh, access to data for services that are, are computing on it. All right, uh, I'll just go through a couple others here. Um, there's also a cosmology example where they're collecting data off of um, instruments in, I believe, in Chile. Uh, that data is now being pulled across the fabric network and then being distributed to several different uh, researchers that need that data. Um, they're applying some in-network -proce in processing. Um, I'm gonna just kind of quickly move through that for the sake of time. Uh, another example uh, is weather information that's being collected by radar, and I believe they also now have drones out there that are collecting this. They're sending it into the fabric network where it's being sort of pre-processed and then pushed out to supercomputing centers uh, based on where the data needs to go and where it needs to be computed on. So you can imagine, uh, here's another example sort of, of measurement devices out there that are sending data in and we need to process it uh, en route. All right, so one other system I'd like to sort of tell you about that we've been working on here, and uh, this is some work that uh, Mam Hashira, who's uh, here today, actually has been working on. Um, we call the one-way latency service. Um, and, uh, or the OWL service. And the idea here is that it would actually be really nice in many cases to understand what's going on inside the network. 
can you tell me how long it takes for messages to fly around in the network? This is actually a relatively uh, difficult problem to do because of clock synchronization. It's difficult for uh, you to actually me measure the time it took from leaving one network node to arriving at another network node. Or I'd like to know how long it took to get through a network node. Am I experiencing some congestion? Is it taking a long time to process my data as it's coming through the system? I'd like to be able to time these things and be able to get very accurate information. So one thing that we've been looking at is, is it possible in Fabric to actually give the community a network service that would allow them to know what the uh, latency is? So measuring round trip is easy. You timestamp the packet at the source, you send it to the destination, and it comes back, and you then subtract the time that it was sent from the time that it was received, and I now know what the round trip time is. But if you want to go just across the network, um, then uh, there's some additional issues that we have there, okay? Um, but with using uh, PTP, and the fabric systems are all driven by, not all, but almost all of them, are driven by GPS signals, so they have clocks that are synchronized very uh, closely. Um, this is some work that Nasir has been doing. Um, he's uh, also here, so if you have questions about this, he can tell you all the details. I'm going to just hit, uh, give you a, a short, quick overview of that in just a moment. But the idea here is that by having clocks that are synchronized, I can now timestamp it at the source, and then I can send it off to the, the destination, and it makes it possible for us to measure the one-way latency just by sending a single message. We could also do it in both directions, so I can find out what the latency is going from uh, one site to the other and vice versa. All right, and ideally, what we'd like to do is do this between all locations and all sites. And so, in this case, you'd be able to be able to tell me, how long does it take for a packet to fly from this router to that router in the Fabric network? All right, so, um, you can see where this type of timestamping service could be extremely useful to a wide, wide variety of applications. Um, you can imagine where I really need to know when did an event occur. If I have several servers out there that are all receiving packets, which one received it first? What's the ordering that they occurred? When I'm logging messages, which log message came in at uh, what, what time? And being able to know that with extremely high accuracy. Right now, we can do that with some accuracy, but not the level of accuracy that we often need. Um, so monitoring and measurement services often need that. Um, if I want to be debugging issues, I need to know exactly when certain packets arrived or when certain events occurred. Um, it may be very important to identify transmission delays. Um, if I want to predict what the performance is, which, which network hops should I be using, which system should I be using, being able to understand these very fine-grained uh, uh, timing mechanisms are important. And there's a whole groups that are now starting to use this for cybersecurity purposes to be able to sort of determine, you know, this message said it came from way over there. Well, it looks like the last hop router that just timestamped it, um, they said that it, uh, that, or excuse me, they said that the message came from nearby, but um, the, the nearby router, the last timestamp, they said it was far away. The question is why did that happen uh, if it took a long time to get here? Um, so there's a variety of different reasons that you might want to do this. All right, so in Fabric, we have GPS-driven clocks. And the way it works is that we have a, actually have an antenna on the top of every Fabric rack, or almost every Fabric rack. There's a few that don't. Um, the GPS signal comes in. Uh, that comes into what we call a PTP time server. The PTP time server then takes that uh, uh, time signal and it sends it into our fabric rack. And it comes into our management network there, where it then is distributed to all the components in the system. So we have several different clocks that are being used throughout our racks. In particular, there's a host clock. That's the host operating system that's hosting the OpenStack systems. Um, in addition, there are virtual machines that are running on the OpenStack system. Each of them has their own clock. And then it's actually the case that the uh, network cards that we're using have their own clocks in them as well. So when we get this clock signal coming in, we need to then distribute it to each one of those. And so there's been a great deal of work that's been put into trying to make sure that that can be done very effectively uh, and keep the clocks all in sync. So um, there's this just sort of gets into some of the details here. Um, we're using the Precision Time Protocol, PTP. 
Um, it gets its feet off of there, but then uses several Linux uh, programs and, and code right now to actually distribute that. Uh, the ptp 4 l and the phc to sys are two applications that push it through these various stages that I just mentioned. And uh, this can be represented sort of graphically by it coming into the basic host operating system. Uh, and we put it into the host clock. From the host clock, uh, we actually then push it down into the network clocks. Um, we can also, PHP to sys can take it from there and push it into the VMs that are being launched. Each of them then has a device in it that becomes a PTP time sur uh, source that you can read and you can pull the clock time off of that very accurately. Now, so that's really nice. Now we've got uh, accurate clocks that you can read. The question is, well, what do I need to do in terms of actually being able to read those? So one thing that uh, users of these systems need to know is that it's really important that you know what you're timestamping and when you're timestamping it. So for example, you can make a call and say, I'd like to read the clock time, and, and you do that from the CPU. You do that inside the user's application. Well, that's not quite the time that it left the system yet, okay? Um, what you like to be able to sort of do is be able to timestamp it when it left the system. Unfortunately, that's not a capability that's supported by our network clocks, so that doesn't actually timestamp outgoing packets. However, it does timestamp incoming packets. So as packets come into our NIC cards, we can actually timestamp them as to when they arrive. Um, they can actually go through the levels of the operating system before they get to the application, and you could timestamp them again uh, when they actually get to the application. So we actually have sort of three areas that we can timestamp them. For the purposes of our one-way latency service, we timestamp them when they're sent, put that timestamp in the packet, uh, and we send it across the network. It arrives at the network clock, uh, network interface, and we have use the network interface there to timestamp it again so we know exactly how long uh, it took from the moment it was sent to the uh, time that it arrived. All right. Oh, network interface card, yes. Yeah, the network interface card. Thanks for asking. All right, so if I can figure out how to do this. Um, so this is work that Mommy did just recently. And if I can get it over on the other screen here. It's not going over there. Maybe I can get out of this temporarily. There we go. All right, so this is an interface that she recently put together. And it allows you to download from the system. There's an experiment running on the system right now that has processes running on all of our fabric racks. The fabric racks are exchanging messages uh, every minute right now. Um, but that can be adjusted um, to, to measure and keep track at all times of what the latency is going across the network links that we have. So uh, given this, and I guess maybe I better quickly download again just to make sure I've got up-to-date data, um, you can go over here and you can select uh, which network nodes you want to go between. So this star is a, a node in Chicago, uh, the Starlight system, and I can select, uh, another, oops, I can select another node here. So let's say that I want to go to... Um, uh, we'll just go to UCSD, that's California, so Chicago to California. Um, we can submit our query here, and uh, it will come back, and you can see it's uh, highlighted in red on the, on the chart here, which links we are we're actually monitoring. And if I scroll down here, you can see that the latency right now is bouncing around between 22.94 milliseconds, milliseconds? and uh, 23.04 milliseconds. So we're getting uh, a little bit of variation over time over the last three hours, but actually it's, pretty, it's, it's staying uh, reasonably uh, consistent. And so uh, this service is actually available for anybody to be able to go out and look at it and pull the data from. If I go back here, I can pick a more interesting one. I wanna go from one side, CERN in Switzerland to Hawaii, where's Hawaii? Is that Hawaii? I can't see from where I am. Okay, uh, so if we submit that, 
It should draw a new red line showing us uh, the links that it's actually set up. And it can then come back and tell us what the current uh, status is. Oh, it looks like it slowed down from, this seems longer than yesterday. So they must be experiencing some network load. Um, but we're still only bouncing around between 111.14 milliseconds and 111.26 milliseconds. So you can see we're getting very uh, fine grained thing. Mom has something she'd like to add. Ah. So it's in a destination. You can typically we measure the round trip, but you can see, you know, that sometimes one direction is faster than the other. You know, um, and and to me that was very interesting because. All right, so let's try that. We'll quickly submit. Yes, so it's 111 in one direction and it's 97 in the other direction. Uh, going back and forth here. So. Um, at any rate, so this is an example of a service that you could build on top of it that becomes useful to others, other applications then uh, so that they can make use of understanding what the network looks like and uh, how packets are moving through. All right, so let me, just for the sake of time. All right. So, um, how do users use Fabric? Well, uh, basically there's a portal that you log in, you get a user account, you log into it. Uh, there are multiple user interfaces. The one that people are most familiar with and most often use is a Jupyter Hub. Uh, they log in, they get a Jupyter Hub uh, container. They can then run Jupyter Hub notebooks. The Jupyter Hub notebook has commands in it in Python to be able to create your slice and specify what you'd like in terms of your, your particular application. It starts up the VMs for you on your behalf. And then once that's all done, you can then log into your VMs uh, at that time. Uh, and then you're free to deploy whatever code you want. You can deploy your code directly from the JupyterHub notebooks, or you can deploy your code by actually logging in as you would on any other system. All right, one last thing I'll just mention to you. Uh, another thing that our team's been working on is what we call MFLib, the Measurement Framework Library. And this allows uh, applications to very quickly deploy code into their own experiments. So if you want to do some measurements and monitoring of what's going on in your own experiment, you can do that relatively quickly. It's an automated measurement system. So you create your slice in your, your experiment. You put VMs out, out at the routers that you want. You, you start them up with the JupyterHub notebook that I mentioned earlier. But then at that point, you run MFLib. And MFLib will go off and find all of your router instances and it will automatically instrument it, put code on it to start up services to do measurement and monitoring for you. And there's several things that we collect. We collect uh, numeric measurements. So we can tell you things like what's your CPU load, how much memory are you using, uh, how much disk space is being used, as well as event logs that record events that may have been going to uh, things like the system logs. And in some cases, you may even want to do packet traces. Uh, we have some capabilities for doing that as well. And then it becomes very easily easy to visualize that. All right, so uh, the way you would do it, you might sort of set up a three node topology. You might pick out three nodes across the fabric network and you connect them together. Um, what we then do as part of MFLib is to actually create a parallel network so that we don't interfere with your tra traffic. We can also do it over the, the other one as well. And many people, that's fine. They don't care if you interfere with their traffic. Um, but if you really want to keep your measurements separate from the actual experiment traffic, uh, we can actually build out a, a separate measurement plane for you. And we put in a measurement node. We add one extra VM on a, on a different rack. Um, this is often located on what we call our, our EDC rack. And that rack is responsible for collecting the data. So at this point, we then instrument it with software. We're particularly, we're using Prometheus and Elk. Uh, with file beats and exporters to send the data from the nodes. So it does this sort of in a uh, li limited amount of uh, additional overhead to the actual nodes that were, were being monitored. And then we actually can build uh, a system through the management plane that allow you to get access to the graphical user interfaces that are part of your, the measurement system. All right, so what happens? Well, once you've got that, you can log into your measurement system. It gives you a graphical interface. And you can see all sorts of things like what's your traffic load, what's your load in the system. You can uh, 
see how many uh, um, system log events uh, were occurring on different nodes in the system. You can tell uptime, all sorts of uh, metrics that are available. And you can actually dig down into the, the details oftentimes um, because we're actually getting very detailed measurement information coming back. Um, we get dashboards that tell you exactly how much network traffic you're seeing. You can see your loads, your system loads, uh, and you can pick out individual, uh, individual routers in the network to see how well they're behaving and whether they're actually doing what you want. So uh, this gives you a, a very quick and automated way to be able to see what's going on in your experiment. All right. Um, we also have uh, other ways of looking at load and CPU uh, through the ELK system. This is particularly actually useful for, for, packing, for tracking packets and understanding what's going on with the, the packet loads. All right, so I will, without further ado, I think that's pretty much all that I really wanted to cover today. So uh, this is a little bit about what Fabric is, and we hope you actually generate some ideas in your own head about how you might rethink application design. Uh, now where you now have the ability to program the network, not just the end, end system. Thank you. We have time for, uh, for some questions. Okay, if you have questions. Okay. Yeah, so one of the things that I think has been happening fairly wildly with all of these Internet of Things devices is that you're seeing lots and lots of cloud services that are basically set up as their main charging mechanism. It's sort of, sort of like printers were cheap, but the ink was expensive. Yeah, now you can buy a webcam uh, that has you know, full motion control and so forth for like 10 bucks, and then you pay $10 a month for the cloud access for it. So the question is, how does something like that play with this? Uh, how would you do software as a service type charging and that sort of thing when some of these services move into the network? Ah, that, that's, a great, that's a great question. Um, I will tell you at this point right now, Fabric was in its construction phase and we're just trying to figure out how do we actually make it available for people to program, how do we create that. So uh, um, we don't have that capability yet, but that is certainly something that uh, is a great question. If you actually have the ability to program them, how do you get compensated for offering these services? Uh, there was a project, uh, and I think Dr. Calvert just walked out the door, that Dr. Calvert uh, was PI, and, and, and um, that was looking, they, they actually called it ChoiceNet, and they talked about an economic plane being built into the network where you exchanged, uh, you ex exchanged um, compensation for resources that you were using. Um, so there have been architectures that have been designed and sort of prototyped to look at that particular thing. We don't have any of those features right now in Fabric, but you can certainly imagine that that would be a useful capability. Ah, oh, there's Ken. He, he should answer that question. Actually, I'm going to ask another question. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to rephrase Hank's question. So today, if I want to program the network, essentially uh, getting a slice on Fabric to run an experiment gives me that ability, right? So once I'm in, once I'm in, once I have a slice, I can do whatever I want to with it, including program everything. Is that is that true? That's not completely true, but so there are some constraints. Um, so first of all, when you get an account on Fabric, we do decide what resources you get access to. Um, so, for example, it's being used by students in Fabric. They get access to relatively few uh, resources, just enough to get their classwork done. Okay? There are other researchers that are coming in and say, I need huge amounts of disk space, I need huge amounts of compute time. Uh, in that case, they actually submit a ticket and ask for those resources. And so we do actually have different categories and different permission settings to determine what things you can get to. Um, and uh, one of the things that we are in the process of working with the uh, access group is to actually allow people to write proposals for allocations if they have really, really large uh, requirements. So we do have some mechanisms in place. Other questions? 